Sir, very nice to invite Dr. Jimmy Pawan Kumar to our second production uh, of this month. So, Professor Jimmy Pawan Kumar is from Aysar Pune and he is working on various areas related to uh, optics and software. He is a pioneer in nanophotonics and nanoplasmonics as well. So, uh, he has done his PhD from JNCSR uh, Bangalore. After that, he moved to Institute of Photonics Barcelona for his uh, postdoctoral studies. And he was also a research associate at Purdue University. Uh, he has joined at Aysar Pune as an assistant professor, where he is serving as a professor right now. So, I once, once again I welcome Dr. Jeev Ban Kumar on behalf of the department uh, to deliver this talk. And I welcome all, all of you who have gathered here to attend the talk. Yeah, and the stage is yours. So, good evening to everybody. Uh, uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, uh, Professor Nirmala and Professor Vasudev Roy for all the faculty uh, here in the uh, IIT Madras Physics Department and also students who are here and uh, who are part of this presentation. Uh, I also consider this as a kind of a privilege uh, that I can give the talk to a department which uh, uh, contains very important people who have uh, served in physics community. So I, I take it as a privilege. Thank you very much. Uh, there are students in the audience. So I would actually ensure that the level at which we have this particular uh, discussion will be slightly uh, not a specialist, but kind of a, a, at a level where you will be able to address and understand uh, the questions what they are asking. If somebody is interested, I would be very really happy to give more, more information. So there are uh, two aspects which I have to now focus on. One is to define what do you, what do you mean by so-called hot drop motion and uh, hot drop collides. And also uh, some very interesting aspects of structuring light and how this interaction can lead to some uh, emergence and various different interactions. So the central question uh, that is of interest uh, uh, to my group and that is a kind of a list of questions we have been addressing for a few years. And the central aspect is to realize how the equilibrium soft systems are using light. So when we what do you mean by output equilibrium? It is essentially now looking at soft materials or soft matter which actually have been taken out of the thermal matter. And the pathway through which you take this soft matter system out of equilibrium is using light. And in addition to using light to take it out of equilibrium, you can also probe the system using light. So that is the second part of the, the, the uh, where you can utilize the light which is now emerging out of this out of equilibrium system and understand this interaction in some some some. The sub questions involve uh, how to influence Brownian dynamics using light. First of all, what happens if you now look at some particular kind of systems which are sensitive to light? How how, how does the Brownian dynamics? And uh, especially I'm going to focus uh, on effect of optical confinement. Uh, it has some aspects related to optical research, but also something which will be more broader. And uh, I'm going to also show how one can study emergence uh, of a spatial temporal patterns using such kind of uh, The sub-question also involves what are the implications of Brownian dynamics and pattern formation on statistical problems. Because this is something which is very interesting about actually driving the system out of equilibrium. One can ask the question, how does this particular system evolve uh, in the context of the light which is in fact in the Now, central to this is a very interesting part of optics which is called as statistical optics, which is generally not kind of discussed when you consider, let's say, conventional optical interactions. But uh, there is a lot to learn about all parameters of light, which I am going to show you in a few minutes, where the statistical aspects of the light which is emerging out of disordered matter can give rise to some very interesting prospects, including spectrums and, of course, pattern formation. And the tools what we use, of course, are mainly experimental, but we also do a little bit of theoretical analysis and numerical simulations, where the driving forces are mainly in optical domain, but also we kind of take some uh, aspects from thermodynamics and uh, include this combination to probe some specific questions. Another tool which we have extensively used over the years is to understand how optical momentum 
both in terms of spin and orbital aspects can couple to soft matter systems. And uh, time permitting, I'm going to show a little bit of information about this particular. And of course, uh, optical tweezers like scattering and uh, uh, something called as back focus animation or Fourier presentation is also a tool which we extensively use. So this gives you a kind of a platform about questions. And now I'm going to take up specific questions and and talk a little bit more about it. Now, the, one of the beauties about physics is the is this units of matter what you can now study. Be it from molecules or even down to let's say particles inside the nucleus, all the way to planetary systems. You can now look at these kind of uh, units of matter and confine them uh, in various different ways. So, you can classify that confinement either as an external confinement or some kind of self-reinforced confinement. For example, within the external confinement, you can look at hard confinement and soft confinement. And the soft matter actually is a playground for this particular confinement effects, especially in the domain up to, let's say, even the scales of insects, etc. Of course, you can also study the statistical mechanics of this in various different but what is of interest to this particular talk is some particular region, especially in the context of spatio-temporal confinement, which can lead to emergence. Where you can now look at the matter, which is interacting with light, and you can essentially have some very interesting emergence from this kind of assembly. The second point is, in addition to just looking at this dynamic structure, you can also ask what is the function you can achieve. Because what, once you have created this kind of out of equilibrium system, what is the use of such a system? This is the next question one can actually ask. So I'm going to probably touch upon both these aspects in this talk. And uh, I, I would urge you, especially the students, to actually have a look at this very nice overview article. And this is essentially taken from there. And uh, the, the region of interest which I'm going to discuss about is something related to the soft external confines. So there are various different questions related to this. And let's look at it. Now, out of equilibrium soft matter systems, when you, whenever you actually are studying such kind of systems, you actually can drive them and you can use confinement effects of the so called structured light. I'm going to define in a minute what do I mean by structured light. The second problem, uh, aspect, as I have been mentioning, is that you can also probe this system using light. And this is a fundamental kind of problem. Uh, goal in, in our research and uh, some of the stuff what I am going to talk about mainly is in the domain of colloids and colloids as I have also defined in the abstract is kind of a prototypical system which forms the basis for both biological matter and conventional soft matter systems. So there are various interesting questions related to the soft matter which can be addressed by considering colloids which are very well characterized and you also have control over how you can manipulate those colloids. And I am going to talk about now, the interest, uh, interesting aspect of using light to drive the system out of equilibrium is its versatility. So, if you now look at the, one of the aspects which you study extensively in, in, in a, let's say, statistical mechanics, is to look at the mean square displacement as a function of the lag time. Now, conventional Brownian motion is associated with kind of interactions where you essentially have the mean square displacement proportional. You can also you can also kind of span over a very specific region of interest with the mean square displacement, where you can use light to switch the Brownian particle either to some diffuse energy, super diffuse energy, direct or So this actually has very interesting implications. And my goal is to actually tell you that how you can play around with this light, the parameters of light, especially the degrees of freedom of light, in actually looking at this dynamic. One of the aspects related to light matter interaction is to ask what is the regime in which you can look at this interaction. So there are three aspects to this interaction with the regime. One is to look at the scaling of the particle which is scattering the light. If the particle which is scattering the light happens to be much smaller than the wavelength of the light which is scattering, you classify that as a Rayleigh regime. Prototypically, it's biomolecules and small structures which come into the range of few nanometers fall into the variability. Important aspect is that you can use dipole approximation to study such kind of regimes. 
therefore are very powerful ways, for example, confining atoms, etc. Et the intermediate regime is where the real action is, so to speak, because you would not be able to treat that purely from a conventional dipole model. Neither can you use it in a geometrical optics regime where you can use the rules and uh, aspects of geometrical optics to understand the real In the intermediate regime, you have to have a full-fledged electromagnetic theory to, to understand this particular interaction. And this creates a very interesting opportunity and also a very powerful tool to actually manipulate light because of the fact that you can now play around with electric and magnetic fields which are facilitated by these kind of structures and actually can give rise to some very interesting things. Now, structured light. What do I mean by structured light? One of the important aspects is the degrees of light. So this is actually a wonderful kind of representation of a light beam, what you can represent using this very simple equation, where essentially it has a term related to the wave and the frequency and a phase. Now, by considering a light beam, I am considering each and every part of this particular light beam. You will be able to tailor the properties of the light beam. Interestingly, you can structure the light beam to have some specific parameter of the light meaning the degree of where you can either play around with the frequency, the so-called topological charge when it comes to the phase, which is essentially related to optical vortices, for example, or it can be polarization signatures. It can also be some kind of nonlinear optical effects where you have some kind of attraction of pulses, etc. Et the degree of freedom and the real part of light being such an important tool is kind of is, is shown in this particular. This is the power of why light happens to have such a large avenue uh, to, to provide some very interesting parameter space which you can utilize to play around with these optics. I am going to touch upon a few parameters, but what I want to impress upon you is that there are multiple parameters which we can utilize. So we will be barely really you know, scratching the surface, but there is a lot more to really understand and also utilize when it comes to such interaction. Other way <coughs> of structuring light is to actually take the light beam and interact them with specific kind of surfaces. So one of the ways to actually create this kind of interaction is to excite something called surface electromagnetic <coughs> One of the very famous examples which has extensively been studied, especially in the context of optics and also conventional magnetics, is the so-called surface plasma a simple definition is that it has coupled oscillations of light and electronic charge density at a metal dielectric interface. An example is shown in this particular diagram where you have a metal and there is a dielectric medium on top of this particular metal. In this case, I have just considered it as a fluid. By specific means, and specific means I mean where I have been able to actually somehow manage to excite this surface using the incoming electromagnetic radiation having satisfied certain boundary conditions, can now give rise to some oscillations of these charge densities. Interestingly, if you look at the electric field profiles across this particular boundary, which is again determined by the skin depth of the media, they are exponentially decaying And this is actually one of the important aspects of plasmonics, which you would have heard about uh, this thing in various different contexts for various different now what you will see is that we have utilized this particular interaction not only to create this kind of exponentially decaying electric field, you can also use it to create localized heat heat uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, entities, where you will be able to manipulate how heat actually can be delocalized and which can lead to some very interesting interactions. So for example, you can now take such kind of plasmons, you can excite the plasmons from the distal end of a silver nanowire and the thickness of the nanowire mind you is as small as few <coughs> tens of nanometers in this particular case it's 100 nanometers so if you excite that particular uh, plasma using a light of let's say 650 nanometer then the scale is already quite different which means that you have been able to now kind of transport the optical information from one region to another region through a conduit whose dimensions are smaller than and this is actually one of the important aspects of plasmonics, 
because you have been able to transport information uh, in the subway network. You can map them. These are beautiful surface waves. What you are now looking at is an experimentally measured waves on such kind of nano wires. They have very nice oscillatory signatures. And also, they can have some very interesting interactions with the environment. But I'm not going to go into that. You can also localize the plasmons. Instead of having ex the kind of extended objects, you can now take, let's say, for example, gold nanostructures and chisel them according to various different geometries. And you can localize the surface oscillations around a particular particle. And shown here is the light scattering from such kind of particles. We are merely changing the, the, the geometry of the kind of structures can give us this very really beautiful kind of uh, spectra of light, uh, what is generally, uh, not generally feasible with conventional interactions. Now, one of the goals is for, for me to actually show how you can interface this with plasmons. This plasmons with soft matter, and that's, that's actually one of the main goals. So uh, the outline is to just introduce you to hot brown motion, plasmonic colloids and confinement, especially I'll talk a little bit about swamps and networks with metal fluid interface. I'll also talk a little bit about extreme statistics uh, in the optothermophoric interaction. So this is all to just give you a kind of an overview of what, what are the interesting questions. And uh, uh, I purposely made it a slightly broader in context so that you get a flavor for, for the topic. I'd be very happy to actually go in details and give you more. Uh, passive uh, colloids interacting with the uh, so-called 1D optothermal source, the nano wire especially. Especially you can talk about uh, pulling, trapping and crystallization in such kind of uh, systems. And the thermally active and uh, active passive colloids under confinement where you can look at some emergence in these kind of systems. Uh, spatial temporal patterns, emergence of chiral rotation. And um, finally I'll just conclude with prospects and So uh, as I mentioned, I, my goal is actually to give you an overview, uh, but if you really are interested, I will be very happy to discuss this more. Uh, so, let me first introduce you to the fascinating concept of hot browning motion. The concept of the hot browning motion actually is relatively recent. The idea is the following that you now have a, a particular particle which absorbs light, and if you now illuminate this particular particle with an external electromagnetic radiation which absorbs. Uh, which, and if you have a particle which absorbs this light, the local temperature of this particular particle is much larger compared to the surrounding. In the conventional kind of uh, system, where the dissipation actually is relatively fast, you would be able to pump this amount of energy onto the system and dissipate into the into fluid which is around. In hot brownian products, what happens is that this particular particle, what you are illuminating, actually is going to a sufficiently large temperature such that the difference between the temperature on the particle and the surrounding is relatively large. So much so that as long as you are actually illuminating this particle for a reasonably long period of time, this temperature difference is significant. Now, as a consequence, what happens is that you can now look at diffusion coefficient in the context of the conventional equilibrium process, but instead of now having conventional temperature and the viscosity, you replace them with the hot brownian temperature and a hot brownian viscosity, which are essentially kind of effective temperatures and viscosity. These effective temperatures or effective viscosity and temperature essentially depend on the change in the or the difference in the temperature regimes. They also crucially depend on various different parameters, such as what is the nature of the particle which is being looked at. Now, there is a co-moving temperature associated with this particular particle. You will also have to associate temperature with respect to two degrees of freedom. One is the translation degrees of degree of freedom and also the pressure degree. Therefore, you will not be associating only one temperature, but you will have, have two temperatures. And now, one can verify this in experiments. Look at the coefficient, measure with significantly high accuracy. And it has started to be very effective. And uh, this, is, this is also an experimental group, uh, Frank Chico's group has been closely collaborating with Boston and they have done some significantly interesting experiments uh, and if somebody is interested I will also urge you to have a look at this hot microscope because it's kind of a review article giving you the overview of uh, this hot in motion and how this can lead to also some interesting questions. Uh, 
electrical uh, swimming mechanisms. So you are associating Yes, yes. You actually also have a collective kind of motion which can occur. That complicates the problem a little bit more. But the, in order to understand this problem purely from a theoretical viewpoint, you associate only one single particle and look at the chemical. But you can also do the sum of the, these kind of interactions. In fact, in experiments, it's very easy. I'll show you what we have done. In fact, in experiments, it's much easier to bring all these hot collides together. There, uh, it is much easier to do some measurements. But treating the problem in theoretical sense, Yes. Yeah, yes. This, the temperature also will go down, right, with the with the surroundings. Yes. yes. So this is that delta T. This is. Uh, yeah, the delta T is the difference between the temperature at which the, the particle has been elevated due to the illumination, and there is a bath temperature which is available. And now there is a difference between these two temperatures. In conventional equilibrium systems, this dissipation is very effective, meaning that you would be able to pump this energy into the system and it gets dissipated into the system. Here. Because of the fact that the particle has been designed such that there is a far larger temperature gain due to the pumping, therefore the dissipation is not faster. So it's still at an elevated temperature, and hence also as emphasized this, this author a prototypical non-equilibrium system. So this is the always the authors keep that we mentioning this Now let's look at what happens if you look at these kind of structures. So I'm going to give you the experimental aspects of this this kind of. Uh, hot ground in colloids, especially when you look at this large number of particles. So, one of the colloids which we have been extensively studying in our group is a pulse stream colloid, which actually is infused with uh, some kind of uh, iron oxide material. It is actually infused, which means that it is not just on the surface, but it actually it is also in the bulb. So, the overall temperature raised rise in this particular uh, colloid is reasonably large. So, if you take light and illuminate this particular particle, they actually are associated with these parameters, which are very important equations, where the power, what is now uh, kind of uh, related to this process, can be divided into scattering and the absorption process. So the cross section plays a very critical role, and the cross section actually is a, is a parameter which is dependent on the material what you are interested in. Now you can also use electromagnetic theory and look at the electric field of the light and essentially the mod square of that. Is, is essentially the intensity, and here is where the light pattern interaction comes into picture. You essentially have the imaginary part of the dielectric constant of this colloid times the, the electric field at uh, mod square, which is the intensity, and times the frequency divided by 2 will essentially give you the heat power density. So, if you take this particular particle and you have an associated heat power density, you take the volume integral, you end up getting the total power absorbed. So, this can be matched with. That's how you can also do experiments, where you can measure this sigma absorption with the reason of the light phase. This is something which you measure, for example, in Beer Lambert's law and other things in other contexts. But uh, this is actually a very interesting, some theoretical arguments. Now let's look at what happens. If you now look at this kind of structures or particles, light can be used to create a heat source and associate it optothermal forces and talks and because of this particle. This is something that we have So now let's get into the problems of interest. One is the plasmonic colloid center confinement. I'll talk a little bit about swarms and networks and also some experiments. Now the crucial question in this is to address how to control and flow spatiotemporal fluctuations of the so-called hot brownian colloids or an extended spatial scale. Okay, so we are interested in looking at these colloids with a very large number of particles, not a single particle. Now one of the ways to do this experiment is the following. And uh, we take let's say a metal film, which is either gold or silver, and you have a glass cover slip, and you have now a light beam which is now interjected into, into this particular system, and you now look at this, the uh, aggregation of the particle in this, this, this particular regime. So a kind of movie is this, that the light is illuminated, there is a blob of fluid containing these hot brown colloids because there is now a specific kind of boundary which is open in this case, it creates some kind of conductive field and as a function of time you start seeing a of particles. Interestingly, you can actually visualize this where you can look at the colloidal assembly uh, using single excitation. So what you see will now be in the form of an ellipse. This is because if you take let's say a Gaussian profile, 
and you take a cross section of the Gaussian profile at an angle, what you end up actually getting is an ellipse. So the ellipse is what is being projected onto the Kuda surface. And this is actually the, uh, the, the, the aggregate of <coughs> particles, which are essentially in, um, at an elevated angle. And uh, the interesting question now to ask is, can we probe this particular aggregate from statistical signatures? Uh, uh, and I'm going to show you. So the advantage of this is also the fact that you can switch off and on the feed, which means that this is a reversible process. And also importantly, you can move them around. So for example, you can take this swarm and you can move the swarm from one region to another region. For example, here we take a 90 degree cut or uh, and, uh, assembly is taken from one particular region. This is all on, on unstructured metal fluid. Now, interesting aspect is to ask what can be done. In, in, before addressing that, we actually look at uh, the kind of configuration of space the cobalt actually can occupy in the context of the electromagnetic interaction. So we, are, we also perform uh, some kind of numerical simulation. In this case, it's a kind of a finite difference type of calculation. Where I'm showing you the two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional. So for example, you will see that at the junctions between the particle and the film, you have a large electric field which is activated. And these fields actually can have various different configurations. And those configurations are what of, are, are of what are of interest to us. For example, how do you probe the electric fields in such small gaps? One of the ways is to insert some kind of molecule, which actually can now get trapped in such kind of interstitials. And you can study the light scattered molecule from such And that is what we do in the experiment. It's slightly more complex experiment, but uh, this is what you get. So what I am showing you is the fluctuation of the molecular light scattering from this dynamic assembly. Without going into details, I will mention two to three specific points. First and the foremost is if you capture the light from such kind of uh, aggregates, you see a very, very kind of evident fluctuation in the scattered light. And this particular fluctuation essentially is coming from the inelastic scattered photons from that particular assembly, point number one. The second point is, if you now ask more than one molecule to compete for this particular region of interest, you can now ask, what is the probability of detecting that particular molecule in this aggregate? So if you have two molecules, so there are four different possibilities. Either both molecules are detected, no molecule is detected, either of the molecules are detected. Now you ask, Within this particular time evolution process, what is the signature which we are obtaining as a function of time, which can be associated with these four different possibilities? And you can now perform principal component analysis. And uh, skipping all the details, the end what you get is this particular histogram, which is a prototypical example of an extreme statistic. What you are seeing now is the probability of detecting or the number of events for our for zero molecules, in this particular case, it's only one particular molecule which is detected, or you can get signature from the other molecule. And whereas there is a distribution in this particular region where there is hardly any signal from the experiment. But these are the extreme statistical events, what you are now probing in such kind of interaction. If you keep increasing the concentration of the molecule, what you end up actually getting is that instead of having this extreme statistical events, you get a Gaussian distribution at the center. If somebody is interested, there is a lot of information in the supplementary part of this paper. Uh, I will urge you to have So, one would be able to actually study some very interesting statistical events in such kind of aggregates. And there is a lot to learn because these are also systems which actually are crowded uh, systems. So, therefore, interaction with a specific kind of crowded environment is, uh, is a motivation to, to look at these kind of interactions. You can now complicate the process. Instead of actually going from single excitation, you can include two excitations. One of the important things which I am going to show you experimentally is that if you now have an excitation which is now kind of emanating this kind of optothermal waves, it not only creates the aggregates or particles in this region of interest, it also start form chains. And this is the, uh, the two ellipses uh, which actually are illuminated. And, uh, have a look at this. If you look at it very carefully, there is not an aggregate at two, two particular locations, but there is also a chain which is formed. I am going to show you a better image, 
And that is actually the chain formation. And this is what is the snapshot with high resolution. What you are now looking at is the configuration of forming these long chains. And mind you, this is actually over a very large, large kind of spatial scale. Then you are able to aggregate the particles. And you also can connect these aggregates with this, this particular chain. And this is all happening at metal fluid intervals. So therefore, if you switch off the light, these particles which have drawn in objects will go back actually uh, under, the, uh, under the conventional uh, room temperature. Now, you can take this further and actually include multiple beams. And you can start looking at patterns, uh, which I actually emerge out of this. Uh, one of the interesting things, and this is actually the fun experiment which we did, but it turned out to be very interesting. If you take an isosceles triangle, now if you take these particular positions as the points of the, uh, the three vertices of the triangle, if you now eliminate these uh, three parts, the question is to ask how does the aggregate forms? And the second point is when you have an isosceles triangle, there is also something called as orthocenter of the triangle. And you will see there is an emergence of the pattern which occurs with the orthocenter. And, uh, if you look at it very carefully, there are three part locations at which this particular aggregate happens. But there is also something which is happening exactly at the opposite. And this is totally a remote kind of controlled You can do the analysis. For example, this is a high resolution snapshot of the same thing. Exactly at the opposite, you will be also obtaining large fluctuations. You can study the dynamics of the fluctuations, etc. Et but I'm not going to do it. Is the light used in simulation structure or it is not? It's just gaussian. I'll talk to the structure, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just using a surface electromagnetic waves as a structure field. I will track of the complication as I think. So, uh, why, this, why these lines are being formed? Yeah. yeah, this is the important question. What happens is these lines are formed because if you illuminate this particular location, there is an optical field and a thermal field. And there is now an interference of these two fields. And this actually combination of these fields actually give rise to a potential at the region of interest. And the location where this is there, it's a weak potential. And we have done some simulations, etc. This is exactly the at least the viewpoint what we have got from looking at the thermal or the temperature distribution of that. So therefore there is actually a potential that created and hence will be now, now I'm going to actually take this picture and reduce it to sub-wavelength scale. And uh, the question is that can you really shrink this particle to scale which is much smaller than the wavelength of light? And the answer is yes. So what I'm going to show you is essentially the same experiment but down but done at a scale which is as small as single level. Okay. To begin with, I'll show a small swarm an aggregate where you now actually have a small nanoparticle instead of a film on a glass surface. You eliminate this uh, particle. You start forming this small aggregate. These are all, mind you, single 250 nanometer nanoparticles, brownian products, but now they have become hot brownian products because of the fact that you are now able to aggregate them. So, so if you switch off the light, they go back uh, from, from that perspective. Now what is interesting is you can look at the distribution of temperature. For example, we do kind of a elaborate uh, three-dimensional uh, numerical analysis of the temperature distribution of this particular gene where, look, where we look at the gradient of the temperature and uh, we see that the temperature profiles essentially are only around this particular point. Unlike the, unlike the previous case where the delocalization used to happen, where you actually got this very interesting remote asymptotes, you are now able to localize this particular interactive to a very scale. And therefore, one can now track only a few objects around this particular point. You can again study the molecular fluctuations. Yeah, okay. uh, I'm not going to go into detail again, except to mention that you again regain re this extreme statistical behavior, which I, I, I have been talking about. Now, uh, this is actually one of the interesting experiments where you now have an anchored particle, and you have now this Brownian colloid. Can you trap single colloid and study the exactly. And uh, here you go, you, the laser is off, the particle actually undergoes brownian motion and now gets 
So this is actually a single layer of nanoparticle which has been trapped. Mind you, there's still some kind of fluctuation. When it sits on that particular surface, you go back and you can see that the particle still moves around. So the potential well is not very very tight. So you'll we'll be able to go back and forth. Now, this is actually a test bed of very interesting statistical process what one can study. And we have been looking at it. In fact, I've been discussing with some of the colleagues there. I've been telling also that uh, we can trap the uh, nano diamonds using these kind of structures. A lot of people are interested in looking at the fluctuations from such kind of trap entities. There are interesting questions. What's the reason that the power of this? Yeah, this particular power is as low as few, uh, in fact, fraction of a milliwatt. In this particular case, the power density is 0.1 microwatt per centimeter Okay, but I can confirm that uh, having uh, had a look at it. But it's uh, at the wavelength is 530. So it's extremely low uh, power, let's say. And there's also quite a, quite a lot of information which I did not actually uh, kind of uh, discuss. This is also not a pure optical trap. It's an optothermophoretic trap. So therefore, there's a thermophoretic interaction which is happening. There's a lot of more details. But what is interesting is actually the statistical properties of this kind of fluctuation. That is the emphasis I have used. The thermos of the Yes, yes you are absolutely right. Because the heating efficiency is, if you remember the hot brownish curve, I have to have a large temperature. And the absorption peak actually should be matched with the laser. That's actually an important point. So those little particles are actually coated with sometimes? No, in this particular case, they are just pure uh, gold nanoparticles. As uh, just 250 They are not coated with dye, but what happens is there is molecules in, in this particular uh, environment. So when you trap them, the molecules also actually come and get into the interstitial. That's how we study the fluctuations. Because we are interested in the electric field oscillations, or rather the, uh, the fluctuations. And that we will be able to explain. Uh, now interestingly, you can actually play around. And you can now move, the, move this particular point. So what I'm showing you is the transport of the sun. You now are able to trap this particular particle. And you'll see once we have trapped the particle, we'll start moving this aggregate. Let's have a look at it. Particles have been trapped. Once you trap these particles, the assembly is moving towards the left. This particle one which is stuck also joins the assembly. This is where we started. And you'll see the particle will be now moved down. So you can now perform transportation of these kind of aggregates. And this is all Brownian motion, what we are now looking at. And uh, this is the region where the temperature is very harsh. And you will see that once the light is switched off, the particles go back. So you can do this cycling multiple times. So now, there is no potential in this case, right? The potential is provided from the nanoparticle. So there is a laser potential also. And then the collective, uh, collective transport is because you have many particles, hot brown and particles yes. coming and then basically they are, they are. Right? and it's also the direction is totally random. Totally random. Totally. No, no, we actually move them. The direction actually is, is guided by us. Okay. We take a particle, we move the laser beam. Because of the fact that there is a co-moving temperature, wherever you now move the particle which is trapped, that moves the whole aggregate. Yeah, that is the important. Now I am going to actually show you, or uh, rather switch into scales which are slightly larger, where instead of actually looking at very small tiny particles, we can now look at some, some uh, questions related to 1D optothermal sources. So, question is, what is the effect of a 1D so-called thermoplasmonic source on dynamics and assembly of plasmic particles? So the idea is the following. If I think mention about the nanowire plasmons. If you now take a wire which is made of silver, roughly about 393 nanometers, and if you illuminate this particular wire at an appropriate rate, you would be able to now project this 532 nanometer laser light through this conduit, and you have light which is coming out. Interestingly, if you look at the temperature distribution in such kind of systems, you also actually have a, a very nice decaying field of temperature. Which means that the region of interest or illumination actually is the highest temperature and it tapers down along this particular system. The question to ask now is what happens to a colloidal system which actually comes in the system? What is the kind of dynamics you obtain? 
can you now look at this interaction in a specific uh, way? And uh, let's look at it from a full one single particle energy. In the single particle energy, you start seeing this very nice ratchet. So very systematically it will actually come to a region of highest temperature and gets done. And you can now play around, switch off, go back and forth, etc. Now, instead of having only one single colloid, you can now have this wire, and you can have the excitation whose polarization is along the length of the wire, and uh, you can compare that to the polarization perpendicular. Let's see what what one things. When you actually have along the length of the wire, you start forming crystals. A very nice hexagonal pattern <coughs> emerges because of the fact that there is now an excellent speed and this temperature gradient actually facilitates nucleation and you can create a Whereas if you go to the polarization perpendicular, you will see that this crystallization is not happening. So you will be able to confine the particle only to the region of the interest here. But these particles are still undergoing this hot brown motion, but uh, the other particles are just sleeping around. Now, there are a lot of interesting questions, why it happens, what are the implications, etc. But I just wanted to give you a gist of this particular uh, kind of thing. Okay. Now, in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to just talk a little bit about thermally active and active plasma covalent. This is slightly new field to work. I will especially uh, talk about spatial temporal patterns and also a little bit about emergence of chiral pressure. The question that we are addressing here is uh, how do thermally active quartz evolve in structured optical potentials? And this is where the structure comes into picture. And how does this evolution change for active passive Now, one of the ways to actually create a structure like the simplest configuration, what we can create is you have a defocused laser beam. And you take the same provide what I was talking about, which actually is, under, which is a light absorbing provide, and you illuminate this light through a high numerical aperture optical lens and create some kind of a, a kind of an optical potential, whose potential well is not exactly like a conventional harmonic, but a distributed wash bolt. Essentially, it is a defocused laser, and then we use a fast camera to to study the dynamics of the system. To begin with, if you take conventional polystyrene colloids where there is no absorption or hardly there is any absorption and compare that to let's say a polystyrene colloid which actually shows this hot brown motion, this is actually one of the fundamental differences. So once you actually illuminate that, you will start seeing a very nice hexagonally packed uh, covalent crystal forming uh, centered around the intensity maxima of the defocused layer. So this is actually uh, the conventional system. If there is now a hot browning motion, you will start seeing long range attraction and a short range repulsion. And these colloids actually start kind of showing some kind of patterns, especially in the context of spatial temporal fluctuations. And you will end up getting this very nice, well separated assembly of these kinds. Now, the interesting aspect is to look at the temperature profiles, etc., etc. So, one can also study this in the context of the repulsion mechanism. For example, if you now look at this, if you keep increasing the laser power, the particles will just get repelled from this region of interest. So, therefore, the particle actually is not right at the location of maximum intensity, but there is some kind of interaction that is happening. So if you decrease the power, the particle goes to the center. So you can actually play around in the placement of the particle. You can also play around with the polarization of the particle. Then you switch the polarization from the one particular orientation to the plane to another orientation. So you can see it switches its orientation because of the fact that you have tuned the polarization. Now uh, you can also look at this in slightly greater detail. For example, what is the it actually uh, initiates the absorption. It actually facilitates the absorption. In fact, that's the reason why it, act, it creates the hot kind of uh, motion. Uh, because it actually elevates the temperature of the Now, 
one can use uh, liquid crystal uh, phase transition to study the temperature and uh, I'm not going to go into details but this is a very nice kind of trick you can use to actually look at uh, the radius of the ring and the region within the ring actually is an isotropic fluid and the region outside is essentially a metal. So by looking at this very nice kind of uh, circle, you'll be able to uh, read out the temperature. So you'll be able to tune the temperature and you can actually measure the temperature. Now this is very useful to measure temperatures around the core. There is a very useful part. We can also do means by displacement. You end up getting prototypical uh, confined motion or confined uh, dynamic regime uh, for a trap which you are expecting. You can also uh, obtain uh, some kind of effective uh, spring constant for the uh, for the, uh, the potential of your creator. You can actually play around. Uh, there, there is a lot of interesting information one can extract out of such experiments. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yes. what is the reason for this active particle for short range repulsion? The short range repulsion essentially is because that there is now a local heating around the particle. The particle actually is now under thermophoretic attraction. The particle is now interacting with the other particle. Once it comes very close to the region of interest, if you look at the control experiment I showed, wherever the heating is maximum, the particle tends to actually go away. But it actually cannot escape because there is an optical potential. So there is a kind of tug of war between these two and that's the reason why. It actually has a ramification on optical burning. Thanks for mentioning because it's a slightly more specialized thing. You are absolutely right. There is some kind of interference at that. For example, this data shows hovering and trap configuration where you can trap the particle and another particle which actually doesn't have any local information. But it's purely interacting with this and it's getting kind of because this is purely happening because there's an interference between these. So we have also done some uh, maximum stress tensor calculations to determine the forces around the particle. You would be able to see the binding effects. Uh, in fact, I do not want to go into detail, but uh, thanks for that. You can study the dynamics of this too. And um, you can switch the polarization from Y to X. You can see the orientation of the is this particular interaction has changed. And this is all happening that is at a, at a slightly faster scale, we have been able to image this using fast cameras. Therefore, the dynamics is essentially what you're looking at is a slow down. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the Now, one information which I wanted to share with you is this observation of so-called viral location. Now, instead of having only this light absorbing particle, if you take two passive particles and attach an active particle, and uh, how you do it is a, a different question. What you will start observing is that purely because of some kind of trapping potential, there is now a delocalized heating around the particle. And the transfer of momentum actually has to somehow kind of be considered. So therefore, this particular momentum has to convert itself into a regime where there is some kind of effect. This is what you observe. Here the pink, pink particle is this and here the pink particle is this. It purely depends on where the active provider actually is joining this assembly and you start observing this kind of rotation. So the particles actually rotate in one kind of handedness, in the other one actually they go the other way around. So what you are observing actually is that essentially the onset of the kind of rotation which can be studied in terms of gravity. And this is purely happening because of the asymmetric temperature distribution and uh, there is no angular moment which has been transformed. It is purely temperature difference which is created. But now I will just switch the gears to come to a structure where I will purposefully introduce an angular moment and let us look at the dynamics and cut it. The question is what is the effect of orbit optical angular moment? on such kind of structures, what is the nature of momentum transfer? So, because the students are there, I am going to very briefly tell you, you can actually have light and you can actually create optical vortices, which can carry both spin and orbit light. So the light beam, which conventionally you study in normal laboratory situations, is a Gaussian beam, which does not, it contains only the, or rather it carries the, uh, the linear uh, uh, momentum, which actually can be important, radiation, of course, etc. you can study. 
in addition to such kind of solutions to a uh, paraxial Helmholtz equation, the general solution actually is something called as Laguerre Gaussian. Laguerre Gaussian modes are the generalized solutions for paraxial Helmholtz equation. And if you solve that Maxwell's equation, you would actually end up getting the solutions carrying a light beam carrying spin angular momentum and orbit length. What does that mean? That means that now you can now have a beam which actually has a helical paper which can have both orbital angular momentum and a spin angle. What I am going to show you is a kind of a, a, a animation where if you switch from OAM and the spin, you can combine them to, to carry something called a total angle. So you can now have an orbital motion and a spin around this particular axis and uh, just pay attention to this L plus sigma, uh, 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 this particular uh, number which essentially is, is giving you the total. So now you are now looking at minus 3, it is just going around. The spin actually is 0 in minus 2. Whereas now in minus 1, there is the spin which is rotating the particle in the axis but also kind of revolving the place. So what one can now look at is the transfer of this angular momentum while playing around with this orbital and the spin part. Remember, the spin essentially is the polar edge. It is the plus h cross or the minus h cross which is the AOM or the OAM actually is an infinite extent, but it actually can go from minus h in theory. Now, we actually prepare such beams. Uh, I told Basudev that I am going to show you some <coughs> optical schematic. And this is actually a setup which we have built very, uh, yeah, almost now 13 years since it's a kind of Gaudi's building, it's been under construction always. So, but we are very, very, you know, uh, proud of this particular setup which has, which has given us a lot of PhDs and other things. Uh, so, this is a setup which is a kind of a uh, two channel optical tweezer where you can also have a second beam and various different beams. You can also have a special like modulator and this is all custom built, it's a home built uh, system. So, we have been able to actually also couple that to spectrometer, off camera, etc. And uh, a lot of uh, information actually can be extracted from, from, from this. Uh, I probably have not touched upon even a couple of them, but uh, we also do this momentum space imaging for momentum transfer uh, experiments. Uh, uh, maybe some other time I will be happy to discuss them. But what you can do with such kind of thing, uh, experiments is that you can ask colloids confined to an optical vortex. So the, uh, the orbital uh, uh, index in this particular case, which is a topological charge, L is equal to 3. What you will see is this. So, this is a fast camera image. So, what you are now looking at is the colloid, which has which, whose angular momentum has been transferred from the light to the colloid. You, have, you, you are looking at single colloid, two colloids, three colloids, four colloids, and then multiple colloids. Now, if you now look at this particular experiment in the context of thermally active colloids, you will see that there is some change between the passive and the active. So, the rotation of the structure will be effect Yes, exactly. In fact, this is actually where the thermal effect is prominent. You will see that there is a sudden change in the angular momentum. We have also done uh, cross correlation measurements, uh, auto correlation measurements for this. I am not uh, talking about that, but what is interesting is that you can set this thing into motion and study the dynamics. Excuse me, I have a way Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, this in by this particular case, the fast means roughly about thousand frames per second. Okay. Yeah, roughly. You, you buy this from the market. Yeah, yeah. We actually buy this and interface that with our setup. Uh, in fact, a lot of fluid dynamics <coughs> experiments also uses such kind of cameras. It depends on the field of view. You can actually go smaller, and then your FPS actually can be increased a lot. You can play around. Uh, this could be a case of classical entanglement where the polarization and the Yes. Orbital angular momentum mode are entangled. Is there any way by which you can entanglement transfer to the colloid? Under construction, <laughs> this is actually a very important question. You wouldn't be able to do it. People have been using uh, also polarization singularities mm. and uh, looking at the angular momentum transfer to the singularity spot is available in such kind of systems. Prototypical case is this classical yes. entanglement. Yes. This is actually an example of that in certain regimes. One actually can study that, 
But uh, the, the measurement what one requires to do is to tune the polarization. In this case, only the L value is being actually matched. So if I bring L and the, the S, and then look at the spin orbit coupling, then I will be able to this is actually a classic, this is, thanks for mentioning this. This is actually a prototypical case of classical impact. So, uh, there is a lot of stuff which we actually have uh, done which has been culminated in this roadmap. I should also mention that IIT Madras has a very interesting contribution too in this roadmap. Most players group has done some very fantastic interesting things. So, especially for students, if you are interested, please have a look at this roadmap. You, you'll be able to learn a lot of interesting uh, prospects of how this area is emerging. And uh, in terms of uh, the uh, optical vortices, I've written a kind of pedagogical uh, article uh, which probably will help students to understand some interesting questions related to this. If you're interested, please, please have a look at this. And uh, finally, the prospect I'm going to end is that the out of equilibrium soft matter system, what we are now looking at, in the context of driven and confined uh, kind of system by structured light, we also use light to probe such kind of system. You can look at this whole interaction from two perspectives. One is uh, the statistical mechanics of perspective where you actually have mean square displacement, for example. You can also look at this whole process from a statistical optics perspective, which I haven't uh, discussed at all. So, for example, if you now look at this kind of disordered systems, you can have laser illumination. You can form this so-called speckle pattern, which shows some very interesting statistical kind of uh, signatures. And you can now utilize imaging systems to do an image transformation and digitize this. So one actually can look at this from a viewpoint of information This, in my opinion, is a kind of an untapped potential. Because most of the information transfer, of course, is quantum energy, which is Really interesting. But this here is a classical viewpoint where the light and the disordered system actually can combine with each other and can give rise to something interesting. This is still a question open for the further discussion and exploration. But I think there is a lot to understand. And uh, finally, I would want to actually end with this very interesting and very famous. Essay by Anderson. The constructionist hypothesis breaks down when confronted with the twin difficulties of scale and complexity. The behavior uh, of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles, or you can even take ordinary particles, it turns out is not to be understood in terms of simple extrapolation of the properties of the particle. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear, and the understanding of new behavior requires research which I think is as fundamental in nature as the other interactions. So finally more is different and wonderful. That is exactly the, the point I would want to express. And the, probably the most important slide is the acknowledgement. I would actually want to thank a, a lot of because in experimental group everybody has to be thanked. We can't do experiments without thanking everybody. That's the reason I definitely show this. Special thanks to Partha who initiated this. He's now in Philip. Sunny who is now in Oxford and uh, Deetha Vata Paul incidentally finished his PhD a couple of days ago. And also his brother is a PhD student in this department. Uh, so I just met him and uh, that's an interesting connection. And Rohit who is now a faculty in the University of Birmingham and Kurt. And the current PhD students have put in a lot of time in effort in understanding some of the process. And special thanks to my colleagues with whom I have a lot of discussion, Vijay, Pratim, and uh, the of that. And uh, funding comes from various different sources. And the most important thing is uh, thank you.